So hello everybody. So I'm Dr. Anil Venkatachalam, a consultant neurologist at Reliance Hospital in Lucknow, Mumbai. Today I'm going to take an overview of stroke, the risk factors, and the management. So I've kept it very simple, and basically our aim is to understand what is a stroke, what is the global burden of stroke. what are the causes of stroke how exactly a stroke is caused what are the types of stroke how do you identify a stroke what are the risk factors for a stroke how do you manage them in an acute emergency how do you manage a stroke in uh, then how do you manage stroke on a long term basis so the first thing is what is a stroke a stroke is an event which is caused by the disruption of a blood vessel in the brain so anything which causes a disruption in the brain vasculature is actually called as a stroke so a stroke could either be a hemorrhagic stroke where actually you have a brain hemorrhage which is because of the rupture of the blood vessel or it could be an ischemic stroke because of an infarction so there's a blockage to the blood vessel which causes ischemia as a result of which the area around the I mean the area supplied by the artery is blocked as a result of which uh, you know that area gets infarcted so we always keep speaking about this you know there is a global burden of stroke and the impact of stroke so we need to realize you know basically uh, what is the global burden of stroke so if anybody has ever had a patient who's had a stroke in the family they would realize what is the burden of stroke you know when somebody in the family has a stroke the entire family goes for a toss so basically your job goes for a toss the schedule goes for a i mean the schedule goes for a toss people would have to wake up early in the morning to take care people would have to feed these patients etc so there is a physical burden for stroke you need to realize that somebody who is paralyzed somebody who's got weakness of one side of the body cannot do his or her activities of daily living as a result of which they need to be nursed they need to be taken care of so there is a physical burden of stroke so a stroke patient is completely or partially dependent on another individual to take care of his or his or her activities then there is a huge financial burden of stroke so when somebody gets a stroke especially in a country like ours people are reluctant you know even if they have recovered from the stroke people are reluctant to give them jobs or if somebody who has got a stroke in young you know gets a stroke he loses his job and he loses the productive years of his life uh you know in the us alone last year a stroke contributed to basically a debt of 250 billion dollars just stroke alone so you can imagine what is the magnitude of the disease burden in india i mean if it's a lower socio economic status individual stroke would actually push that patient you know to have you know to actually go into his savings it would actually push that patient actually into poverty so stroke has a huge financial burden there is also a psychological impact of stroke you know somebody who's had a stroke basically you know has got you know if especially if you have got something like a cosmetic sort of a deficit you got a weakness etc you got slurring of speech so there's a psychological impact a stroke just impacts the confidence of the individual there is a significant loss of confidence patients go in for a depression they lose their jobs they are reluctant to socialize etc so there is a huge psychological uh, impact which people don't realize and there's also a social impact so again as i said it's actually interlinked the psychological and the social impact of stroke is again interlinked if somebody has had a stroke he stops mingling in society you know because of the fear that people are going to brand him as uh, lame or limp or having a physical sort of a disability it, i mean people are very conscious of themselves as a result of which they start withdrawing themselves they don't mix in society they reluctant to actually come out and say that they have had a stroke they have survived from the stroke etc and finally we need to realize that there's a huge impact on the family so again as i said if somebody has a stroke in the family 
the entire dynamics of the family goes for a toss. So just imagine this scenario, you know, you have a nuclear family and in the nuclear family, you have, you know, husband, wife who are earning, they have basically a couple of kids who are going to school. At the same time, they have their elderly parents who are staying with them. I mean, it's very similar to, you know, the kind of families that we see in Mumbai. Imagine if one of the elderly parents actually has a stroke then what happens? You know, the children's studies go for a toss because you would have to nurse and take care of the elderly individual in that small cramped up flat in like Mumbai, which is very difficult. At the same time, the jobs of the husband and the wife would actually go for a toss because again, one of them would have to wait at home and actually take care of the elderly individual if they are not affording. If they are affording, and they're going to arrange for some help, either from the nursing bureau or some of the A&M staff, etc. Still, it is going to be a huge financial impact, especially on a long-term basis. And you have to realize that stroke patients can prolong for a long-term basis. No such patients can survive for like 10 years, 15 years, and 20 years with the same amount of disability. So our aim is to prevent the disability and intervene at various points of time such that we are able to help these individuals. So when we look at the types of stroke, it's very simple. We have an arterial stroke and a venous stroke. Arterial stroke is further subclassified as ischemic, which is because of a blockage in the blood vessel, which is seen in 85% of the individuals. And you have hemorrhagic stroke, which is because of a brain hemorrhage. Again, a hemorrhagic stroke is further subclassified as you know, due to a subarachnoid hemorrhage where you have bleeding around the brain, or it could be because of an intracerebral hemorrhage where there is bleeding inside the brain. Again, hypertension is actually a major cause. Then there is a small subsection of individuals, especially in India, especially the younger individuals who present with venous strokes. Now we need to realize that these patients often present with headache, they present with seizures, they present with one-sided weakness. They are the younger individuals. Again, you need to identify the venous strokes because if it is untreated, then it could cause a lot of disability. It could cause a lot of mortality. If it is treated, the advantage is that complete recovery is possible. Almost about 98 to 99% of, patient, means of patients who have a venous stroke can have near total recovery. So we need to realize that. So when we look at the causes, the cause is very simple. It can be because of problems in the brain. It can be because of problems in the heart, or it can be because of problems in the blood and the blood vessels. So it's very simple to identify the problems. So in the brain, usually it is as a result of, so we are mainly going to focus on ischemic strokes. We are not going to focus on subarachnoid hemorrhage or intracerebral hemorrhage in this, it means like in this, um, I mean, in this lecture, as a, you know, the main reason is that 85% of the patients present with ischemic stroke. So again, it could be a blockage of the blood vessels which supply the brain. It could be a blockage of the carotids, could be an atherosclerotic disease involving the MCA or basically the distal vessels. It could be a problem related to the heart. So a patient who's got poor LV function could um, have a LV clot as a result of which, you know, you could have a stroke. It could be because of atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation, again, is a very, very common cause of stroke in the elderly people. Any structural abnormality of the heart, like a rheumatic heart disease, exec, uh, is also a cause of a stroke, or a HOCM is actually a cause of a stroke. Then there's an, uh, you know, then there is also an entity where there could be problems in the blood or the blood vessels. So you could have basically an atheroma in the aorta, you know, which is actually embolizing and causing a stroke. You could have an uh, atheroma basically in the common carotid and which embolizes, or there could be problems in the blood. So you could have blood related problems where you could have uh, basically, just a minute, yeah. So you could have something like a polycythemia, you could have elevated homocysteine levels, or you could have any of the thrombophilia profiles which can contribute basically to a thrombotic stroke. 
like for example sle can you know the autoimmune diseases can contribute to a means to a thrombotic stroke similarly protein c protein s deficiency etc so these are problems with respect to the blood so you know that's why you need to look at these three aspects it's very easy the mri usually takes care of the brain the cardiac evaluation that is the ecg and the echo takes care of the heart we also do a holter to rule out atrial fibrillation and a blood workup usually takes care of the blood and the blood vessels so it's very easy to you know evaluate such patients so what are the vascular risk factors so when we look at the vascular risk factors this is like the typical indian patient that we see you know the elderly 40 year old 40 to 50 year old obese individual probably a diabetic which is not very well controlled obese also has hypertension age so age greater than 65 is a big risk factor uh, you know one of the reasons you need to realize that estrogen is protective in females so when females are like younger estrogen protects them the hormones protects them uh, you know but as they get older and as they attain like menopause the risk becomes the same for both males and females again family history is a very strong predictor for a stroke a strong family history you need to look for it and if there's a family history of cardiovascular events if there's a family history of strokes or cerebrovascular events again you would need to carefully evaluate for the risk factors for these patients also you would need to carefully treat these patients you can actually you know if somebody has got a strong family history of strokes then you need to intervene early so that you can prevent strokes in the family hypertriglyceridemia is also a very common cause of strokes especially in the young means in the younger age group chronic alcoholism smoking smoking is a very very strong risk factor obesity is another risk factor so this these are the very very common vascular risk factors which i have spoken about there are a lot of uncommon risk factors again as i said the causes are fairly limited the etiology may vary you may have various etiologies which can actually lead to a stroke but in general this is actually a gist of all the causes that actually causes stroke so one thing you need to realize is that there is also an entity known as stroke mimics so what are the stroke mimics you need to have a strong index of suspicion need to take a meticulous history and do a careful examination of these patients to actually take care and see that you know you don't choose the wrong patient you know a lot of times patient comes with one sided weakness we think it's a stroke it turns out to be an sol it could be a space occupying lesion in the brain so space occupying lesions infections especially meningitis or tuberculosis etc can be a stroke mimic seizures so seizures cause post ictal weakness so somebody who's had just a loss of consciousness wakes up he could have weakness of one side of the body which usually recovers so this is one thing you need to realize uh so seizures are also a common cause migraine uncommonly can present with weakness of one side of the body there is an entity called as basilar migraine which will present with posterior circulation symptoms like dysarthria ophthalmoplegia etc so you need to realize that so migraine can present with that then all your metabolic abnormalities your hypoglycemia can be a stroke mimic your hyperglycemia can be a stroke mimic hyponatremia can be a stroke mimic similarly hypocalcemia can present like a stroke so you need to realize all this the other things that you need to also know is is there a psychogenic cause you know so if the patient does not have the typical vascular risk factors patient is a young person especially a female it could also be a functional cause so you cannot go and thrombolyze these patients because thrombolysis can actually do harm for them so you need to have a careful a strong index of suspicion a meticulous history and a careful examination very easy so what are the clinical features and how to identify it so i would like to first say what is the difference between a stroke and a tia in a tia patient will have stroke like symptoms it would last only for one hour with reversibility whereas in a stroke there may be reversibility it may go up and down but the symptoms will persist the other thing is i often see in my practice is people ignore tias they say it's like a small stroke or a minor stroke 
So again, that is the time you should intervene for these patients. That is the time you should actually take care of these patients. You know, that is the time you can prevent the stroke. Because as I said, stroke causes a significant amount of disability and a debility in these individuals. So you can intervene earlier, start them on antiplatelet agents, just evaluate what is the cause of the TI. It's like a chest pain, you know, for a heart attack. You know that when a patient gets chest pain, a lot of times and patient has got angina-like symptoms, he may be going in for a heart attack. So that's the time you intervene, you know. When a patient gets a heart attack and after that you intervene, probably it could be too late. And with respect to the brain, a lot of symptoms are irreversible. So we may not be able to give back, you know, what the patient has lost. So it's very important for us to realize that so a TIA is very important. In fact, a TIA is more of an emergency when you look at it than an evolved stroke. So again, a stroke can present in multiple ways, but in general, we remember the three H. So that is hemiplegia, hemianesthesia, hemianopia. That is the three H, so one-sided weakness. Patient can have slurring of speech, vision abnormalities, swallowing problems, again, abnormalities with respect to the sensorium and like memory issues. It's very difficult sometimes for us to identify whether somebody has a stroke or not. And again, it's more of an academic importance. You're not really helping the patient trying to localize where exactly the stroke is. So if somebody has a doubt, just remember the fast rule. So look at the face, ask the patient to protrude the arms, look at the speech, ask the patient to speak and look at the end immediately refer the patient to a higher center for treatment. Again, why is it important? Because in the initial period, strokes are reversible. Once the stroke is evolved, it could become irreversible. So you need to realize that. In more sophisticated centers, you know, if you have the time, if you have the expertise, there is an NIHSS scale, which is called as the National Institute of Health Stroke Scale. Very easy to administer. It is available on the apps. You just have to actually calculate the score. If it's less than five, it's a 42 point score. If it's less than five, it's basically a mild stroke. If it's five to 15, it's a moderate stroke. If it's 15 to 20, it's moderate to severe stroke. And greater than 20 is actually a very severe stroke. So the prognosis basically depends on the severity of the stroke. So usually mild to moderate strokes will do well. Moderate to severe strokes will not do so well. So you need to realize that. So NIHSS stroke scale is an easy way of trying to prognosticate how these patients would be. Again, what's the role of CT and MRI? So preferably, I always uh, tell this, send the patient to a center which has got both CT and MRI facilities. So basically, why are you doing that? You're saving time. If somebody has a stroke, you could refer the patient to the highest center where a CT or MRI is possible and plan further interventions for these patients. So you have to realize, even if the patient has a hemorrhage or an aneurysm, it is, well known that early intervention has got better results for these patients. So CT obviously will not, CT is more of a screening tool. It's faster, easier to do. MRI is more accurate, but it's more, I mean, it's more like difficult to do. Uh, but MRI will actually help us with the prognosis. I prefer the MRI because you can actually tell the patients where is the stroke and you know how you can treat these patients. However, if an MRI is not possible, a plain CT scan is enough initially as an initial screening so that you know whether you have to give the patient antiplatelets or you have to uh, you know, not give the patients antiplatelets and whether you have to thrombolize them or not thrombolize them or whether the patient has an infarct or a bleed. So CT can be a very good screening tool, you know, in the initial stages. So how do you manage these strokes? So we have actually discussed what is a stroke, what are the causes of the stroke, the global burden, the clinical signs, etc. So I've made it very simple for you all, uh, you know, when you look at it. So let's look at the management. So there are three, four aspects to the management. The first aspect is an acute management. So in the acute management, we have something called as thrombolysis, which can be an IV thrombolysis, that is an intravenous thrombolysis or a mechanical thrombectomy. 
and intravenous thrombolysis is if a patient presents within four and a half hours of a stroke from when he was last seen normal. You can actually give a clot busting agent, which is either tenecteplase or altiplase, which can actually burst the clot. There is a five to 10% chance of hemorrhagic transformation, which is known to occur. The risk is more in the elderly as compared to the younger age group. But again, as I am saying, in patients who have a significant amount of a disability, it's worth taking the chance. You know, it's similar to thrombolyzing patients who have myocardial infarction. So, you know, I always tell this, if you can thrombolyze MIs, is even in small like nursing homes and like district centers and government hospitals, why can't we thrombolyze, you know, strokes? And I do not believe that cost is an issue here because the cost of the drug is probably the same. It is almost similar drugs which are used. So it's just the mindset which has to change. So that's number one. So in patients who come out of the window period 5E thrombolysis or who have a large vessel occlusion, you could do a mechanical thrombectomy. So where you insert a catheter and you suck out the clot, you do a four vessel digital subtraction angiography or an angiogram and then suck out the clot. This helps to achieve recanalization and may restore the viable area, which is also called as the penumbra, as a result of which you can limit the amount of stroke. So again, an acute stroke, it is a, I mean, it is treatable. You have treatment options. There are risks associated. So that's why there is a huge role of a tertiary care center, you know, when an acute stroke happens. Uh, in the earlier days, what used to happen is, uh, see a patient has a stroke, the patient would be at home, the GP or the family physician would go to the house, take the blood pressure, and then afterwards refer the patient for an MRI. Then the report comes the next day, by which time everything, we have lost the golden window period for these patients. So now the concept is that you shift them to a stroke ready hospital, ensure that you know uh, they're at least evaluated from a point of view of thrombolysis, whether they are candidates or not so that you don't actually deny them that chance of recovery. Now we have to realize that world over, the thrombolysis rates are less than 5%. So that means out of 100 strokes, only five of them are actually getting thrombolyzed. This is including the big Western countries, Europe, America, et cetera, where the infrastructure is far better. In India, it's even worse because uh, you know thrombolysis is mainly restricted to the high-end centers or the tertiary care centers. It's not really done in the smaller nursing homes, et cetera. Again, because of the delay which happens from the door to needle time, because of in between there are multiple problems. You may not get an ambulance, the neurologist may come later, you may not have a stroke team in place, the ICU may not be prepared for it. The CT scan or the MRI might not be available in the same hospital, so you have to go to another hospital, by which time you finish that four and a half, like five hours, you know, for the window period. Again, for thrombectomy, the window is around six hours for an anterior circulation. For a posterior circulation, that is the backside of the brain, which is far more serious, the window period can go up to 24 hours. But the general rule of the thumb, again, we need to realize is the later the thrombolysis is done, lesser the chance of recovery, more are the complications of the procedure. So we need to realize this. So this is very important for us to realize. Chronic, again, chronic treatment or long-term treatment is basically uh, with antiplatelet agents, that is aspirin, clopidogrel, high dose of statins. If the patient has a cardiombolic stroke, then we give the patient newer anticoagulation. You know, if the patient has rheumatic heart disease, then we treat the rheumatic heart disease, we give them warfarin, so it's helpful. But again, we need to realize that these only prevent recurrent strokes. So again, you need to identify what is the mechanism of the stroke and treat the mechanism, the stroke mechanism. There is also a long-term rehabilitation of patients. So often patients are very well treated at, in the hospital, but when they go home, they come back with poor nutrition, bed sores, you know, they come back in a shriveled way, they have spasticity, severe weakness, etc. Why does this happen? This happens because they don't get good care at home. And it's not the fault of the relatives or it's not the fault of the bystanders or the doctors. It's just that the awareness is not there. You know, you have to take care of a stroke patient like you're taking care of a small child. You have to take care of them 
such that the nutrition is taken care of, the feeds are taken care of, the skin care, the oral hygiene, etc., are actually taken care of. So it's not very, I mean, it's not very difficult, but it needs to be done systematically. And the patient needs, you need to have this, you need to replicate the same care that is done in the hospital at home because it's a long drawn process. And here you also need to realize that a lot of them are elderly, their caregivers also elderly, the caregivers may be their spouse. They may not be strong enough to take care of these people. Most of their children may be living abroad. So there is a huge physical burden also, which is there. Then there is a lifestyle modification. This is very important. We need to stop like tobacco and all the tobacco products. At the same time, we also need to stop uh, you know, smoking, alcohol, etc. And all this will help in preventing further strokes. So we've already spoken about the acute stroke management, especially the emphasis on stroke-ready hospitals, the emphasis on thrombolysis. Long-term stroke management, I always believe this, that there's a huge role of checklist. Stroke treatment is almost protocol-based. So it's not something where you have to deviate from the protocol. It's very easy. If you have a protocol, you just need to follow the protocol. You just need to actually tick it. So you need to have a clinical history, you need to have an examination, you need to have a risk factor evaluation, you need to have the test done, you need to have the MRI done, you need to know where the stroke has happened, you need to plan long-term rehabilitation, you need to have regular monitoring of your sugars, your blood pressure, you need to have functional outcomes, so you need to have functional outcomes or functional goals, so goal setting is the key for like rehabilitation, so there's a huge role of like checklists, uh, you know, in these patients. And checklist helps. This is one of the few places where having a checklist actually helps patients uh, to have better outcomes. It is not so easy with headache, not so easy with vertigo, not so easy with even other things like a cardiac disease, etc. But here you can objectively measure what are the problems, what are the risk factors, and what is the risk factor burden. And you could plan basically the long-term stroke management. So in summary, I would like to say that you know, uh, strokes can be treated if we intervene early. The key is that we need to refer these cases to a stroke-ready hospital. So Reliance Hospital like New Bombay is a stroke-ready hospital. We are prepared for all kinds of emergencies. I mean, we have a 24 by 7 accident and emergency team. We have like neurologists who are there around the clock on duty. We have the neurosurgeons who are there, the neurointerventionists are there. So they're ready for everything. And we have a 24 hour like radiology service where, you know, the radiologist is actually, so the infrastructure is already there. The hardware, the software, both are already there. We just, you know, and we are like ready to take care of strokes. And we also have the beds in the intensive care team, you know, available to take care of uh, strokes at any point of time. It is very important that you have a very good intensive care group, you have a very good physiotherapy department, because that is where the recovery will happen. So, for example, if I am far away, uh, you know, and patient has had a stroke, it doesn't make sense for, you know, it doesn't make sense for the hospital or the patient to wait till I see the patient. You know, nowadays, with respect, you know, with respect to technology, you can actually send the images. Uh, on the phone, by WhatsApp or email, I can have a look at the images. We can even do a video call, have an evaluation of these patients and take a decision to urgently thrombolize these patients. This is happening all over the world and this can happen even in India. It is actually possible for us to replicate it in India. And as I keep saying that stroke, uh, strokes can be treated, strokes can be prevented. You need to have a high index of suspicion to rule out stroke mimics. You need to accurately treat uh, the cause of the strokes. And if you don't treat strokes, it could actually lead to a significant burden to society. You know, we all have elderly parents in our house. We all have elderly people in our house. We also need to realize that there's a changing face of stroke now. Stroke is not a disease of the elderly anymore. You get youngsters who present with strokes. You get people in the middle age group who present with strokes. So it's now expanding you know, with the population. Also with the poor lifestyle that we have, it's actually increasing its footprints. 
So we need to be aware about it and we need to intervene appropriately. There's a huge role of diet, huge role of exercise to prevent stroke. So we need to be careful. Huge role of the primary caregiver, that is your family physician to take care of your diabetes, your sugars, etc. And finally, the onus is also on the individual to ensure that he or she le leads a healthy life. You know, you need to take care of your health. You may be worried about your society, you may be worried about your country, you may be worried about your nation, you may be worried about everything else. But if you don't take care of yourself, you're not really going to take care of anybody else. You know, you need to realize that. So with this, I actually conclude my talk. I try to make it very simple for you all. Try to understand in short, like uh, what is a stroke, how to take care of strokes, what are the risk factors associated. If there are any questions, uh, I would be glad to sort it out for you all. Yeah? Thank you.